Hey everyone, this is Mason Hutchison and welcome back to Herb Rally, your daily herbal podcast. Our goal for the show is to help you along your herbalist journey no matter what stage you're at. But I really just wanted to let you know about a sale that our good friend Demetria Clark over at Heart of Herbs Herb School is having a 40% off sale and that's 40% off all of her programs. Um, this is an online herbalism school. It's been around since 1998, so Demetria has been doing this for a while. Uh, and how I know Demetria is actually through when I worked at Mountain Rose Herbs, I was in charge of their herbal education program. Um, and so, yeah, I started that probably 11 or 12 years ago. I, I didn't start the program, but I was running it about 11 or 12 years ago. And I've worked with Demetria ever since. So um, she has she does great work. Uh, she's super knowledgeable. And again, her, her herb school is called Heart of Herbs. You can learn more at heartofherbs.com. Uh, you got to use a coupon code. I should give that to you now. That's H-O-H-40. That's four zero. And then now. So H-O-H-40 now at checkout. And I'll leave a link uh, as, along with the description of how to enter the coupon code in the podcast show notes just so there's no confusion there. But yeah, she's got courses on uh, being a home herbalist, a clinical herbalist, uh, clinical aromatherapy, um, flower essences, children's herbal health, uh, Ayurveda, uh, and really there's a lot more. Uh, you could see all of the courses at heartofherbs.com. As I mentioned, Dimitri's been doing this for a while. She learned herbal healing at a very young age. Uh, she's had training in her teenage years, and then later on she apprenticed uh, with Rosemary Gladstar, both beginner and advanced training, uh, amongst many, many others. Um, and she received her aromatherapy education from the Pacific Institute of Aromatherapy, as well as Jeannie Rose. Uh, she's the author of several best-selling books, Herbal Healing for Children, 475 Herbal and Aromatherapy Recipes, Aromatherapy Essential Oils for Healing, Live Healthy Now, and Aromatherapy and Herbal Remedies for Pregnancy, Birth, and Breastfeeding. Also, I'm not going to read her whole bio because it's quite extensive and impressive, uh, but she's also the director of Birth Arts International, which is the premier doula certification and training organization. But yeah, I really just wanted to jump on today to let you know about her 40% off uh, all of her courses. Again, that's heartofherbs.com. Use code HOH40 now at checkout to get 40% off uh, any of her courses. So that's going to do it for me today. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll talk to you uh, maybe tomorrow, uh, but definitely very, very soon. So take care. Have a great day. Little bit of housekeeping before we get into the show. The content in this podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes only. It is not intended to cure, diagnose, treat, or prevent any disease. This information has not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. We are not doctors, nor do we play one on the internet. Please seek advice from a qualified healthcare professional. Okay, MC Calico, take it away. Yeah. Smoky herbal blends. We need some mullin and some kush, my brethren. While listening to Herb Rally podcast again. Herbalism at its finest with Mason Hutchinson. Yeah. Oh, hi, Biscus. Lately, hibiscus is coming up and it's tall. Is that the one you use for tea? A grandmother with a poodle and toddler beckons from the other side of a fence. Oh, phew, I thought I was busted for letting myself into someone's garden. But she is a nosy bystander, too. I pry myself from the chain link fence my belly is pressed up against while photographing this plant, trying to make it look taller. And I launch too excitedly into the part about the calyx and the various species and zone hardiness. Thanks, she grabs the toddler's hand protectively and skitters away. I let myself out of the garden, but I realize that this is a plant that I also have some questions about. The things we're familiar with are its taste and color, red and sour or astringent. It's purchased as loose, dry, crimson, stiff, whimsical strands that we would probably call the petals, but is that accurate? 
At the garden center, we used to hoist tall plants in pots, flowering in white, pink, or red, or fuchsia out of trucks from southern climates to be sold just before or during their prime. We hounded dazzled customers that these were not guaranteed to overwinter. Most of them didn't really care. They were buying these just for the momentary thrill. And a few resourceful ones wanted to know if these were the same as hibiscus tea. And we'd get dizzily excited knowing a little, but not a lot about this, kind of like in the garden earlier. If you crush the leaves of any mallow family member, notably hollyhocks and hibiscus, you will be met with a satisfying or startling slimaciousness. That's mucilage made of polysaccharides, if you want to be cheeky about it. The mallows also have distinct funnel-shaped flowers, but th these certainly aren't the only family with funnel-shaped flowers, so this is a bit of a problem. These also have five petals and sepals, still not unique, but the sepals, that green part under the petals, can be quite pronounced, that is big, and the flowers are among the hugest you may see growing anywhere, especially if you're in a temperate climate where they may be planted as an annual, or if we're lucky, they overwinter. And here's the outrageously cute identifier. Mallows are called cheeses because the ovary and resultant seeds are huge and together sort of disc or squat chubby pumpkin-like in shape like a miniature cheese wheel, maybe just a half an inch broad. And this part is called a schizocarp. That is a specific term for a dry fruit that splits into many seeds when mature, exactly like a Toble chocolate orange. Also, if you're into looking for such characteristics, characteristics, the ovary is superior. And this is not a feminist statement. It means that it is positioned, the ovary, the physical part of the plant, is positioned above the calyx, um, which is that, again, that little green bit under the petals. That's almost all of the botany we're going to do for now. But this is where it gets really cool. The mucilaginous content of the roots, leaves, or flowers of many of these plants contains natural gums called mucilage, pectin, and asparagine, which can ambitiously potentially be whipped into a marshmallow-like froth. I have not done this, but my friends tell me it is so. I refer you to the many blog posts and videos where I found a range of entertaining and mesmerizing instructions acted out. Mostly we hear of the attempts using Althea officinalis or Malva moschata. Those are the Latin names for a couple species, a couple common species. I would call Althea officinalis one that you're likely to grow and Malva moschata one that you're likely to find in the wild. And these are marshmallow now. So this is a nod to some of the other Malvaceae plants with a similar quality to hibiscus, all of these being mucilaginous. Um, so Althea and Malva were the marshmallows. And it's not a coincidence that the confection is called marshmallow. It was originally made of these plants or ones like it. And interestingly, there are some recipes that include hibiscus where the person sharing the recipe doesn't even let on to the interesting mucilaginous properties of the hibiscus. You'll find that most of these recipes contain pectin also to help it along quite a bit. So what about hibiscus and what is it good for otherwise? That slightly mucilaginous goodness is balanced by a notable astringency. This makes it extremely quenching beyond almost any other infusions when you need an immediate and lasting sense of refreshment. It also has that tart cherry flavor with a little bit of sass, somewhat raspberry in flavor as well as color for the species that is most often used in commercial teas. All of the hibiscus genus um, and some of the common names are rose mallow, hibiscus, rose of Sharon. 
are rich in citric, malic, and tartaric acids. As a hint, those are all known to be quite sour in flavor. And we say that this flavor is lifting and that it's cooling. How about folk uses and other properties? Not all of the Malvaceae are edible or non-poisonous. As an example, cotton is also a member of this family, which can be quite poisonous. Uh, and if you're wondering on that note, yes, other plants in this family have been used for their fiber, though often for flimsier materials than clothing, such as paper. So cotton is somewhat one of a kind, and we'll leave that there. You're not going to consume cotton. Um, so what is hibiscus? Several hundreds of species of the Malvaceae family have been called hibiscus, or belong to the genus hibiscus. Um, we have rose mallow, hardy hibiscus, rose of Sharon, tropical hibiscus, a rose of Althea, and sometimes just Althea, as some of the common names for some of those species. And I should say that probably every single one of these, definitely every single one of these common names is also used for a variety of species, um, at least within the hibiscus and sometimes other species as well. Chinese hibiscus, hibiscus rosa sinensis, is the preferred variety uh, where it is warm enough to grow it, which would be tropical regions. And hibiscus are generally tropical climate plants, but we can grow a few in the north. I would check your zone as well as the zone hardiness of any plant you would like to grow first. Medicinally, I would call it a mild refrigerant. Um, that's a name we use for herbs which are called cooling, which is sometimes documented by research. And there are many nominations from traditional use for hibiscus to be called a refrigerant. There are many sacred, sexy, and fun ritual uses for hibiscus, not even necessarily to use all at the same time. I invite you to look into some more of those, um, which will be accessed readily um, through some of the fun old herb books, as well as um, the good new internet. Um, but I'll give you a little bit of a few fun examples um, or allusions to these uses. Red hibiscus has been used as a symbol and offering to the Hindu goddess Kali in Bengal, India. You can wear a flower behind one ear or the other in Tahiti or Hawaii uh, to designate your dating status. The bark has been used to make rope. And here's a fun one. The flowers are crushed to release the mucilaginous uh, saponic constituents, that is saponins, soap-like constituents. And then once you have this resultant slime, um, perhaps thin it down a bit and use some hollow stem. In the Philippines, it's said that children use papaya stalks. And then they blow bubbles from this um, slimy, soapy mixture. <laughs> and I would suspect that anywhere that there is a hibiscus or plant where this is possible, children have discovered this. Hey everyone, it's Mason. Just a quick interruption from the show to let you know about our 13 herbal freebies. If you go to herbrally.com on the navigation bar at the top of the page, you'll see a button that says freebies. Just click there and you'll sign up for our email newsletter. And in exchange, we're offering 13 herbal freebies. That's eBooks, webinars, videos, downloadable audio, and discounts to cool herbal companies. So if you'd like to check out these freebies as well as sign up for our email newsletter, we update you about uh, current events, new monographs, new videos, etc. Just go to herbrally.com and click on the button at the top of the page that simply says freebies. Okay, that's it from me. Now back to the show. 
Um, you'll find that hibiscus is the representative flower of many islands and nations that these showy plants inhabit. And you'll find a number of literary pieces named after hibiscus or named for Rose of Sharon. But the most fundamental question is tea. The tea we are used to, most of us, is actually the calices. That's plural for calyx, that underneath green part that grows uh, underneath the flower. It's quite large, as I think I've mentioned. Um, and in the particular species that is most often used culinarily, hibiscus sabderifa, the calyx is the part that is used. And at least when it's dried and cured for making tea, it comes out quite crimson. I believe the flower of this species is actually yellow. Its tart, astringent, fruity raspberry flavor is also a bit unique, so not quite raspberry, but remarkably or distinctly hibiscus. Um, it can be enjoyed hot or cold. Either way, the flavor comes through very strong and the color. And you may also know this drink to be called sorrel or hibiscus or subolo or carcadi, also called red tea. And it can be candied or used to make soup or any dish really sour. I would say you could go fairly light handed in making and using it as a sour spice. It's quite strong. And now some more medicinal effects. There has been a lot of hype about it lowering blood pressure. And I used to kind of eschew this, um, dismiss it a little bit. But I've heard quite a few testimonials and also confirmed uh, this with some of the research. So I wouldn't go throwing away your antihypertensive, antihypertensive medicines or encourage anybody to do this. But if you use it diligently, you may experience this benefit. Conversely, uh, conversely, <laughs> if you are someone who experiences woozy feelings or low blood pressure, um, or if you're going to enjoy it quite regularly, then you might want to have it with something salty or not take it all the time or take it in the evening before bed. It is also a uterine muscle relaxant, and this comes from traditional use as well as um, validated by research. So keep this in mind for menstrual tension and cramping. And I would say it's also a nice, not sedative, but just relaxing, refreshing, mineral and vitamin rich um, beverage for anyone who would like to be revived. <laughs> Um, so keep it in mind. Sometimes it's used during colds and flus, again, on the refreshing and comforting note. And additionally, I would say the mucilaginous and astringent qualities together, along with it being so high in vitamin C, um, suggest that this yeast makes sense. It has been used both um, for loss of appetite and also as a dieter's drink. And I know that always sounds contradictory. I would call it analogous to bitters in that it helps set up an appetite for foods which are healthy and nourishing. It is astringent, uh, or it's astringent and bright and tart qualities can help one with cold or sluggish digestion. And for one who craves sweets or is unsettled and to their stomach is satisfied, it provides a little bit of a refreshing stimulation and then relaxation for the stomach, preventing unhealthy cravings. In TCM, it is used for swelling and inflammation of the skin. And I would trust it as a gentle astringent in infusions of almost any strength. Constituents. Now this is interesting. Um, of w at least one species of hibiscus, 15 to 30% is fruit acids, including malic acid, and constituents shared with citrus. It's pretty remarkable for um, any t constituent type to comprise 15 to 30% of a plant, as particularly when they're considered active constituents. We usually see something more like 0.01%. And it's also rich in anthocyanins. So these are antioxidants, which are um, 
which are typically vibrant pigments in plants and serve a purpose in the plants of perfect protecting it against UV damage, but um, seem to, uh, when consumed, protect us from um, from sort of endogenous oxidation that is happening all the time. But if it can be um, somewhat mitigated, that is said to have many health-promoting effects, including cardiotonic or cardioprotective. So um, helpful in maintaining the health of the blood vessels and the heart muscle itself. For example, just for example. Um, And there are many, many different flavonoids and antioxidant constituents in hibiscus beyond the anthocyanins, which are named for the um, red and or blue color that they occur in typically. We also have mucilages, um, including arabinogalactins, and then one that's um, that I don't say out loud very often, ramnogalacuronanins. I think that's how it's pronounced. These are complex polysaccharides, which are definitely mucilaginous, and um, but at least for the arabinogalactins, seem to have some immune modulating effects as well, and perhaps some digestive health promoting um, act, um, properties as well, supporting positive gut flora, for example. As a cosmetic, it has been used as a hair rinse, um, and in China and India, it's the flowers are boiled um, to be used in this way. And additionally, in China, it's been used as a component of black hair dye. And in India, there is a serum made with it that comes out bright red, and this is said to help. Um, it's called and it's un unglamorously um, some sources refer to it as anti dandruff. Um, it's considered kind of a beauty panacea, and I would say that probably balances the, helps to um, balance the skin, uh, perhaps flora or pH, and perhaps normalize sebaceous gland functions. That's just a little hypothesis. I'm not so familiar with the serum of hibiscus. Um, there are some very chancy reproductive uses, <laughs> um, sort of related historically, and I wouldn't trust it. Um, it's really a gentle health promoting herb, so we don't usually see things like this, um, effective in that way at all. Um, but you might run across that. So I thought I'd acknowledge it, um, not to suggest its use in that way, but acknowledge that you might find that. It has also been associated with fertility, so we're feeling a bit, little bit conflicted about these claims. So let's end on something a little bit lighter. Etymology, the meaning, symbolism, derivation of names, etc. So in Greek, apparently hibiscus means both the name of this plant and marshmallow, not shocking. In the Pacific Islands, it is said that if a girl wears a red flower behind her left ear, that means that she is available to date. And if it is behind her right ear, she is not. And, you know, that's not as exciting as this next claim, which is that a girl with a flower behind both ears is suggesting that she has a lover, but would like to look or another. In Japanese, the name of the hibiscus also means gentle, and the flower is given as a welcome to the visitor um, as a social custom. In China, it's, it is said that hibiscus can either symbolize wealth and fame and grandeur, or um, the gentleness of a young girl. And I'm sure because this flower is so magnificent and breathtaking, we could find so much more symbolism associated with it than just these few examples. And if you know of any of these or other uses that I've not mentioned, definitely chime in and comment. Remember that we are going to use it as a refreshing beverage. We aren't going to use it as a contraceptive. And we are going to engage other strangers who are taken by it. 
where you see them, you can often find someone else who's totally fascinated by these huge plants. And remember that if you decide to put a hibiscus flower behind your ear, you ought to be sure that you choose the right one. Anything I missed, do let us know. And as always, thank you for your time and attention. And that's going to do it for today's episode. Thanks so much for listening to the Herb Rally podcast. If you'd like to hear more from us here at Herb Rally, we now have a text message community, believe it or not. Basically, it's just updates from us. We send about one to seven texts per week, uh, notifying you about new events, videos, courses, podcasts. You get the idea. It's pretty much like our email newsletter, just in text form. So if you'd like to receive text messages from Herb Rally, just text JOIN, that's J-O-I-N, to the number 541-256-2895. Again, that's JOIN to number 541-256-2895. And to stop receiving texts, that's easy too. Just text STOP to the same number. It'll opt you out immediately. Okay, thanks again for listening. Have a great rest of your day.